got it. Hi, everybody. So I don't know. I think I'm live now, so that's good. Uh, I'll just wait for a second. <clears throat> so I could, of course, uh, talk to myself, but that's okay. Uh, when you've got a husband like mine, oh, Fran's there, that's good. So I'm not talking to myself. I was going to say, when you've got a husband like mine, who's a, a big Dolly Parton fan, and he has to listen to her singing all day with his headphones in, you kind of get used to talking to yourself. But at least Fran's here. Hi, Fran. Nice to see you. Uh, good. Uh, hi, Geraldine, as well. So I think I'll just wait a few seconds just to kind of see how we get on before I start. Uh, I feel like I should be providing some kind of pre-start entertainment, but uh, all my jokes are a little bit a little bit on the blue side, so probably best to steer clear of that. Uh, hi. Hi, Jocelyn. Hi, Nicola. Hi, Roz. The Somerset crew. Well, that's good. I'm okay then. That's all good. Oh, Gemma here. Gemma Hodson. Oh, I, I haven't got my tambourine, Gemma, but uh, I, if I had it, I would play it. Good. Uh, Diana's here as well. Great. Good. So people are coming in, and I know people are listening, so I better start, haven't I? Uh, well, thanks for coming along and uh, for my little chat. So it is a bit of a chat. Uh, I haven't got kind of fancy PowerPoints or slides or anything. It is just me having a little chat. I am a bit of a waffler, so uh, just join me on, on my waffle. Um, stepping off the opera merry-go-round is what I'm going to talk about, and that will become a bit more clear as we, as we talk through. Um, before I start, I just want to say, I'll give a bit of a shout out to some people because I think it's important that we recognise where we get our influences from. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking about, it isn't the Andy stuff, right? It isn't the Andy way. Uh, I just find my own unique way of processing these things. But uh, we have to recognise those amazing colleagues that we get inspiration from. And I want to touch on that first. So got to start off with Sarah Fisher, the amazing Sarah Fisher. I'm guessing you all know who she is, right? If you don't, then you need to. Uh, Sarah's amazing. I've learned a lot from her regarding uh, doing good observations around dogs. Um, she's a bit of an inspiration. I know she's inspired many of you listening as well. If you want to check out more about Sarah's work, go to Ace Connections on Facebook. Uh, Kim Broffy, uh, some of you may have seen uh, the Beyond the Operant chats that I do with Kim Broffy and Kathy Murphy. Both of those people, amazing. Uh, Kim's book, uh, Kim's an applied ethologist. Her book, uh, Meet Your Dog, really worth getting, Meet Your Dog. Brilliant. Um, uh, Kathy Murphy, of course, neuroscientist. Her, her Facebook group is Barking Brains. Very important. Uh, the wonderful Gemma Hodson, who I know is in the crowd today. Uh, Gemma Hodson, amazing. Oh, my God. Uh, Gemma is doing such great education at the moment on observations and anatomy and physiology. Gemma does some amazing things. I think what I'll do is I might put a link to some of these things in the comments later, because these are really amazing people to link in with. Uh, the amazing Rachel Meadows, good friend of mine, somebody who I get inspiration from on a daily basis because she just doesn't talk it, she lives it. Uh, Linda Michaels, uh, hierarchy of dog needs. Uh, shout out to Linda. Sorry, motorbikes going past, let them go past. Um, uh, and also, I don't need to go into a lot of techie stuff today because We've had some amazing people speak already, uh, and I would really um, advise you to check them out. So uh, Diana and Scott from Affected Dog Behaviour, their talks are awesome, right? Uh, hang on, more motorbikes going past. Let them go past. Um, this is what happens when you live on a seafront in Devon uh, on a Sunday. Everybody wants to come out in their motorbikes. Uh, so yeah, Laura Donaldson, her talk, um, uh, Daniela Beck, Kathy Gregory. These are people who are talking about the emotional aspect, the emotional experience, as I call it, uh, and their talks are well worth checking into uh, and hearing. I'm going to take a bit more of a philosophical look uh, at stuff. So why is the philosoph philosophy and the philosophical approach quite important? Well, we all have our own individual disciplines. So that might be training geek, uh, neuroscientist, ethologist, psychologist, whatever. The problem with uh, or the risk really when we have a specific discipline is that we go closer and closer and closer in to the topic. What I like about a philosophical view is it gives us a chance to come back from it and just to have a little look and just kind of cast our eye over things. So that's what I'm going to do today, a little philosophical look at behaviour and how we as an industry have uh, adopted 
in my opinion, uh, an overly operant view of behavior. Now, uh, that sounds like it might be a bit controversial, but hopefully when I've talked through it, it won't be, right? Uh, some of you are saying you don't hear motorbikes, so that's good. Maybe it's just in my head that I hear them. Uh, good, so let's have a think. Behavior, let's talk on this behavior. What is behavior, right? So, there are so many different views on behavior, so many different disciplines, so many different angles, so many different camps, so many different tribes that kind of come up around behavior. But for me, I like to make it quite simple. And all of my work that I do is based upon the notion that actually there are only two types of behavior. Now, this is going to be quite a profound thought for a Sunday. Uh, but this is what I base everything on when we start thinking about the emotional experience. So there are only two types of behavior. One, the behavior we do ourselves. Two, the behavior we judge in others. Right, so I just want you to think about that, right? The behavior we do ourselves and the behavior we judge in others. Now, breaking it down like this is the way that we can look into why we have developed certain biases towards how we approach behavior. And I just want to break this bit down first because it's a good place to start, right? The behavior we do ourselves, come on to that in a second. The behavior we judge in others. This is really important. As a species, us humans are kind of predisposed to be judgmental of behavior. We, we are more likely to have a, to be judgmental of behavior um there are lots of reasons for that uh when we think about the human brain anyway it's a bit of a predicting machine uh it likes to get um it likes to have an element of surety around outcome uh it likes to look for connections and opportunities to feel safe so it likes to kind of have that uh, element so that's one of the reasons why we're predisposed to judge behavior and look at behavior in that way a big thing of course for us humans is that we are a societal species, right? Uh, so uh, we've created a societal structure. So when we think about things like the rule of law, social cohesion, all these things point us to a fact of us being um, kind of uh, mindful from a very early age about right and wrong, good and bad, um, legal and illegal. So we're being pushed into this kind of element of judging behavior. Also, the looking for us amongst them, uh, we seek out safety, we seek out connections. Scott and Diana talk a lot about that through effective dog behavior. Um, uh, and of course, that makes sense to do that because they're, you know, if we find something of like, we're going to feel safe, right? Uh, so that's another reason why we're, we're judgmental. Also, when we start thinking about um, the different types of judgment, we have personal and um, situational attributions that we put when judging behavior. Uh, so what that means is in, in that kind of terms, uh, we either, when we're doing that judgment, look at it on a personal level, or we step back and look at it situationally. Uh, just a little example of that. If somebody was a bit rude to me or a bit off with me, I could take that personally. I would put personal attributions to that judgment. And I would think, oh, they're saying something deliberately to upset me. Or I can put situational attributions onto that, which means that uh, I'm going to think, well, maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they're tired. Maybe something's happened to them that uh, they're kind of offloading onto me. So this is the thing about uh, judge the judgments we put onto others, understanding why we are quite judgmental about behavior. And of course, this fits when we think about a training model that has developed, which is very much designed around um, around uh, us seeking to change uh, and create and manipulate behavior based upon our initial judgment of that behavior. There is an issue though here about how we judge in others and the thing that we have to be mindful of, and this is just important for us just to think about, who is it who is, uh, who is setting those rules? Who is it who's making those definitions? Who is it who's having that narrative regarding what behavior is actually right or wrong? Now, this is very important because for two reasons. One, we have to recognize ourselves as practitioners, why we might have certain judgments, which obviously leads into things like confirmatory bias, belief systems, 
belief filters we have to be aware of our own but we also have to be aware of our clients that we work with or if there's any caregivers watching who aren't necessarily professionals why they have these judgments regarding their dog's behavior and there is a big risk when we think about the judging of behavior that we're missing the emotional experience of the person or the dog or the animal that was triggering those behaviors a little example of this i'll just share something with myself so i'm a gay man um happily married now living in 2021 great in the uk but when i was growing up in the 70s and 80s it was very much a different environment a very different um kind of cultural view of of homosexuality uh, and people uh, from the homosexual community and i wasn't able to seek out the connections. I wasn't able to seek out through my behavior, the, con the connections that I needed to feel safe because society had decided those behaviors were inappropriate or not allowed. Now, when we look back on it now, when we think about um, Alan Turing, for example, in, in the press at the moment, because he's on the new 50 pound note, uh, Alan Turing, who uh, we all now know was a, an absolute giant in his field, but he ended up taking his own life because of the persecution of just of the persecution just because of who he needed to love and because of who he was so we see that now right but this is the danger of having an arbitrary unilateral view and this is the risk of judging behaviors because we're going to judge behaviors based upon a set of criteria potentially that don't actually reflect the behavior or the reasons why the behaviors were given in the first place and this brings me back around to the next thing so we've discussed a little bit about the behavior we judge in others. When we think about the behavior we do ourselves, we realize it's complicated, right? We know why we do stuff. Uh, there is lots of reasons why we might do a behavior. There's lots of internal reasons why we might do that behavior, a lot of processing that's involved. That's, that's um, uh, for us as, as unique individuals. Um, we are always giving excuses about why we do stuff. We might say, look, I'm really sorry because I was angry or I was upset or I was in pain or I was tired. And we know that behavior is complicated when we recognize our own. And this is why I like to make this distinction between boiling it down to think about that. actually there's only two types of behavior, the behavior we do and the behavior we judge in others. Uh, so uh, this uh, is very important um, when we start thinking about operant solutions, operant only solutions. Now, when I talk about operant, I, I'm talking in a more, I'm talking in quite a general, quite a general way. Uh, I, I don't want to kind of get into a lot of the academic discussions on that because uh, I know there are different areas of the industry who really focus a lot on, on operant side of things. And I think that's fine. You know, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about now, some of you will already get it. Some of you hopefully might think, wow, that's maybe think about things a bit differently. Some of you might not agree with it, uh, and that's fine as well. Uh, just a little point on that. We can actually not see eye to eye on things and still be friends, of course, that's good. Uh, but uh, I'm talking about things based purely upon punishments and reinforcers, and also about external, unilateral, uh, and arbitrary. I'm going to use those two words a lot because they're important. Changing of behaviors, right? So, when we think about our own behavior experience, then our own emotional experience, and this is what I'm passionate about exploring the emotional experience. When we think about our own, we know what lies beneath it. There are things in the moment that might trigger a behavior and there are things that are historical that might trigger behavior. There are things that are based on our past histories. There are things that are based on our past traumas. And yes, there are, of course, things that are based on our past reinforcement histories. But it gets said a lot that behavior is triggered by the environment or well, behavior is led by reinforcement or behavior is started by thoughts and all of those individual uh all of those individual um statements in themselves aren't wrong but there is a big factor that changes this that makes that a bit more fluid and that is that how we all uniquely individually and internally process information that goes on around us. Uh, that, so there are things that might happen, like for me, uh, that I think about in my own life and my own emotional experience. 
that weren't directly triggered by the environment. They were triggered by how I processed the environment that, that somebody else might not have the same emotional experience around. There are things that aren't even there in the environment anymore. So for example, when I uh, went through my grieving process for my mother, there was aspects, it was a lack of things in the environment. There wasn't anything constant going on there. Uh, and I think um, we have to recognize how we internally process. So if we're looking at the emotional experience, I'm gonna come on to the offer and stuff in a minute. If we're going to step into the emotional experience, we have to be mindful of two really important things that are unique for us all and for adults and for adults. The first is how we process the information that we take on. And the second is how that nervous system decides to respond to it. So um, behavior itself, uh, the brain, we're talking about the brain before, uh, it needs information, right? Uh, so we get that through our senses primarily, and that's through a process of called sensory integration. Uh, good old Kath with Kathy Murphy, Dr. Kathy Murphy, should put the doctor on there. Uh, she does a lot of re really good information and uh, resources on, on sensory integration. But we have our senses, it takes on information, then the brain has to process that. Uh, processing is really important. We have to process. The brain has to file stuff away. If I was to hold this pencil up now, uh, I'm guessing nobody's freaking out because you process the pencil, right? And you put it away in your brain. And, and for us humans, especially, we take it for granted that um, a huge amount, over 95% of what we process, we do so subconsciously, right? It just happens because the brain's really good at thinking, yeah, I've kind of seen that before. or I kind of know what that is. And, and it can contextualize things really well. But that processing will be unique to us. Uh, and uh, so what might be a, an issue for somebody might not be an issue for somebody else because of how we process. And part of that is also how we uniquely learn. Now, learning for me, there are two types of learning. Uh, there is um, a difference between structured learning and natural learning. So let me give you an example on that. Uh, so structured learning is kind of what we do with dogs, right? Because we teach them stuff and we make them presumptions that they've learned something. But what is it that they've actually learned? Have they learned something functionally or have they internalized that to have more of a natural learning experience from that? So a little example of that, uh, let me have a drink it. Let's say kids in school, right? So the kids in the classroom are behaving really well for the teacher. So we might presume then that the kids have learned to behave. That's what we're presuming, the kids have learned to behave. But when the teacher's off and the supply teacher comes in, they turn into a pack of feral kids, right? Uh, we've all been there. We've all been the feral kids as well. So what, do we, what can we take from that? This is a good example of that difference between structured learning and natural learning, as in internalized learning. What we can maybe surmise then is that the kids had learnt through constant reinforcement and punishment from the environment regarding that main teacher's uh, education style to behave in a certain way. They hadn't necessarily internalized that this is kind of how we behave to be appropriate and to be supportive and to be uh, and to be appropriate around other people. Because when the supply teacher comes in, they're all kicking off right. And the thing about internalized learning is really important. Um, uh, behavior isn't really truly learned unless it's internalized. Uh, punishment at prison is another good example. If somebody goes to prison for doing something and they're punished for it, the best outcome is that they've internalized that punishment. In other words, they've thought, right, I get what I've done wrong. I'm remorseful. I won't do it again. Uh, and when we think about how we provide reinforcements and punishments, uh, depending on wh what you do, of course, uh, there is an element of that being structured and not necessarily being internalized. And I think this is something we need to consider. Anyway, I'm waffling on about that. I'll come back to that in a minute. So processing, very important. We have to process. So I've got a little analogy for that, which is the doors of the brain. So if you imagine the brain has lots of little doors in it, we need as many doors to stay open to safely and calmly and rationally process what's going on. And there is more chance then of a self-regulated response. So in other words, we can internalize what we need to do processing wise. We can work out what we're going to do, what we're not going to do. A lot of that will come from an, an innate uh, reflexive, uh, not reflexive, an innate um, uh, indicative response of what's kind of worked before, which is which is um, something we have to be staying mindful of. The other, uh, so um, the problem though is pain 
stress, pressure, especially social pressure, which can be a big one for our dogs who are reactive. I prefer the word sensitive, but uh, but the dogs who react to things. Uh, big door closes, right? So uh, the ability to be able to process starts to be inhibited then. What we have to be mindful of is when we are adding in now for that dog extra operant requests uh, or uh, operant training we're doing, are we actually opening doors for that dog or are we closing them? Are we actually adding in something extra for this dog that means there's just one more thing for them to try and process in the environment? Come back to that in a minute because it's an important point. Um, so yes, yeah, so the brain processes uh sensor integration brains processing and the nervous system of course is listening all the time one thing important thing about the nervous system is that the nervous system has been there like forever so if we go back enough time kind of evolutionarily uh the nerve uh, we were all nervous systems once right so um the uh if we think back to early life forms that were just like the nerve net or the nervous system that came along it was a long time before mother nature decided this isn't very efficient i need to bring in a neocortex to try and control that nervous system so the nervous system is pretty powerful and it's always listening in there and i use the good old bucket analogy for the nervous system uh the empty bucket denotes the you know, it's the nervous system and uh, the water in the bucket is about how much that nervous system engages or how much stress the dog's carrying. Same applies for us as well. Uh, so the fuller the bucket, in other words, the more that nervous system engages, the less doors we have open, the less chance of a mindful, rational response, a self-regulated one, the more chance of an irrational, uh, um, emotional, dysregulated response. This is important when we start thinking about behavioral experiences. Because if, when we think about ourselves, we know all these things are happening for us. I've obviously just kind of diluted that down a little bit in quite a crude way, but it's just important to recognize these are the two most important things for me about the emotional experience, uh, about, um, about processing the nervous system. So I'm gonna give a little example of this. Let me give, no, no, I'll come on to that second, actually. No, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, brain's going 100 miles an hour, trying to remember things I need to say. So I'm just gonna bring it back down. Just take a breath like that, How about that? good. Uh, just to calm myself then, which is important to do. So the emotional experience, processing and that nervous system. When that nervous system starts to engage, there is a process that I refer to as relief seeking behaviors. So relief is really important. When, that, when those doors start closing, when that bucket starts filling, we need to get back to how we were feeling before. That's through that kind of homeostatic process, homeostasis process. And that's uh, what I frame as relief. We need relief. Uh, in my opinion, it's only my opinion, uh, the most important word in the psychology behavior is relief. Because when we start thinking in terms of relief, it kind of cuts through a lot of those judgments that we tend to want to make around the dog's behavior. If we start thinking, right, what relief does this dog need? It automatically starts to change our view of what the dog might be experiencing. So I'm going to talk about relief quite a bit as we as we move forward. So um, uh, coming back to our operant approaches then. The risk is that through looking at just arbitrarily, unilaterally seeking to change or manipulate or create behavior, we are ignoring the animal's innate need for relief that it was trying to get through that behavior or what it was trying to communicate through that behavior. Uh, I'm going to give a little example here. It's my snake uh, analogy, which some of you might have heard of if you've heard me speak before. Um, uh let's just say somebody doesn't like snakes very much um sorry if i'm triggering anybody with snakes just pretend i'm saying banana um so let's just say somebody doesn't like snakes very much and a snake comes along they're going to have an emotional um uh it's it's uh, uh they're gonna have an emotional experience around that snake so they're gonna have a neurological physiological response stress right then they're going to give a behavior which is maybe screaming and shouting now let's just say that I don't know much about human behavior much. Uh, all I do know is that that screaming and shouting is really upsetting me. It's really irritating me. Uh, it's doing my head in and I need it to stop. If I just purely look at changing that behavior because I want it changed, 
without thinking about their emotional experience. I only have two options. I either treat them, treat it punitively, so I tell them off, uh, correct them, punish them even, and I might be able to suppress that behavior, I might be able to stop that behavior, but I haven't done anything about their emotional experience around the snake, or of course, listen to what they're trying to communicate. That's pretty obvious, right? But this is important. If I think, right, my only objective is to change this person's behavior, then, and I don't want to do it the punitive way, I'm going to do it in a positive reinforcement way because it's a powerful tool, and I shift that behavior, there is a risk. And it's a real one that we have to be mindful of, that I'm just getting a behavior that I find more appropriate, but is of no innate use to them and their emotional experience around the snake. And this is really important for me because this is what I class as the operant merry-go-round. There's, there's been some comments I know with some of the things I've discussed in the past that I'm kind of anti-operant or don't think it's a viable uh, thing to focus on. Well, of course I'm not anti-operant. Operant's there all the time, right? And, and we can have an operant toolbox, which is great. I think what my message really is, and it's a simple one, is that we have to be mindful about what we're doing for creating and changing behaviours when we have to recognize the emotional experience that might be triggering it for the animal. That's the only thing. And the operant merry-go-round for me is, I'm guessing most of us here are people who would class themselves as force-free trainers, positive reinforcement trainers. And I get why we've created these labels to make some kind of distinction amongst those who have more of a traditional view, shall we say. But actually, I don't think we've actually moved that discussion forwards by talking in these terms. I think we've moved it on because we're saying, well, we don't do it nastily anymore. We do it nicely. But this is why we have the operant merry-go-round, because if we just keep having discussions on social media in different forums about how we best change and manipulate behavior, it will just go round and round and round because somebody else will come along and say, well, that's not this, or that's not that, or this tool would work better. And one thing we have to recognize from a caregiver point of view is if we go into somebody's home and the first thing we're saying when we get in there is, yeah, great, I can help change this behavior. I can get a different behavior for you. Uh, we don't do it in that horrible way anymore. We do it in a nice way. Because of what we discussed at the beginning about why we're judgmental of behavior and how we're kind of pre-wired for that, there is a really good chance that that caregiver is just going to be hearing behavior bad must change it. And then if they are in that mindset, then anything remains on the table for them. And I think if we start, however, educating more about the emotional experience and the relief seeking behaviors that that triggers, then actually this operant merry-go-round discussion of tools and methods and that kind of thing suddenly falls away, right? Because how can sticking a shock collar on a dog possibly help that dog's emotional experience? It makes sense, right? So when we think about the snake analogy, if we're not careful, we're kind of just trying to shift their behavior around the snake. Now this can be, um, uh, this can, it manifests itself in something very simple. So, so let's just think about something. It's an example I use a lot because I think it's a good one. Dogs that pull on the lead, right? There are 101 ways to, to, to kind of operantly change that uh, and 101 tools to do it. Some nice, some not so much. But what if the dog is pulling because it's a manifestation of that dog's generalized anxiety? What if it's because that dog's stacked? What if that dog's um, triggered by the traffic? Good trainers I know, and I know them, I know many, are looking at that first, right? They're like, hang on a minute, we need to, this dog's not processing the environment, right? That dog is having a huge nervous system response, that bucket's too full, those doors just aren't open for that dog to process, and that is being reflected through the somatic system and going into that dog's pulling. If we don't think about what is triggering and stacking for that dog's emotional experience, we're gonna struggle to get this dog to kind of regulate better. It's all about regulating, right? And this explains why dogs in the village hall or wherever learn loose leash walking, brilliant. But as soon as they step foot outside, the dog's pulling them down the road like a train. The owner's trying to do the operant stuff, 
uh, and it might work for a bit because the thing is about relief you might give the dog uh, the dog might attach into the operant training enough to get a little bit of relief in the moment but if that emotional load is too big they're going to start pulling again right so uh <clears throat> another example is dogs uh the the the, the very quick um uh, go to approach of looking at um uh, I can't now. um a reinforcement of incompatible behaviors something again that we think about right so i don't want the dog to do that so we're going to get the dog to do this. What was the dog trying to, to achieve through that? What relief were they trying to get? What if we've now got the dog to do something operantly, right? Uh, but uh, what have we done about what the, why the dog was giving that behavior in the first place? Remember, quite often, the, be, the reason that we're trying to change behavior is because some human has decided arbitrarily, unilaterally, that they don't want that behavior. And I get that as well, by the way. This is something else that's important. Uh, when we start exploring the emotional experience, we have to explore our own as well, as well as the carers. This is the point we have to just step back and think about it. I'm going to come on to the stepping back bit in a minute. So going back to the snake analogy then, person's kicking off and it's doing my head in. First thing I've got to recognize in, yeah, it's doing my head in, right? I recognize that it's doing my head in. Uh, I have to recognize my own exper emotional experience around that. But then I have to allow myself chance to take a breath and step back and actually think about what's actually happening here. Um, because that's how we can look at the best solution. So sometimes having an overly operant solution could be the best option, maybe temporarily, who knows, uh, especially if it means we can give some relief, relief, really good point, right, for the carer. So we just have to make those judgment calls sometimes, but we have to be really clear about what it is we're doing when we're going in and almost artificially creating or changing behaviors based purely upon a human narrative. Uh, we see this a lot with dogs uh, who are, you know, reactive dogs. Like I said, I prefer the term sensitive dogs because for me, the dog is more sensitive to something in the environment. Just that, before, actually, just a little pause. They say, I told you I was a waffler, right? Because I just go off on one. I should have probably scripted this, but anyway, we'll just do it free, freehand, right? Um, hopefully, you're just taking bits that you need. So that's good. Uh, and you can kind of cut through the waffle. Uh, the, uh, so terminology is really important for me. Uh, and if I'm saying to clients, yeah, this dog's reactive, this, yeah, your dog's reactive, your dog's aggressive, I'm going to give you a training plan, uh, all these kind of things, I'm kind of potentially still fitting into that subconscious narrative of theirs that somehow this is a, this is a behavior is a the problem, and I need to have a training solution to get out of it. Because we've all, all heard the expressions on Facebook having, you know, train more, train more, train more. For a lot of these dogs, the last thing they need is more training. They just need a little bit more listening to, right? But anyway, so for me, phrases and terminology is important. So my clients, I call them carers. I say, yeah, you're a carer, right? Uh, because they're already starting to think, oh, yeah, care. I am a carer. And being a carer is hard. And I can tell them that because we recognize that, right? Whether you're caring for an elderly relative or a, a child with behavioral challenges or a dog with behavioral challenges, being a carer is hard. So yeah, calling them carers. Uh, instead of using the words like reactive, using the words like sensitive. Yeah, your dog is sensitive to something. So again, now their subconscious is thinking, right, my dog's a bit sensitive. Therefore, they might need support. And then that's backed up because I don't give reports or training plans. I give support plans. Or, or uh, So it's, it's I'm trying to feed into this narrative of the emotional experience comes first. We need to learn from your dog what it is they need. When we think about the sensitive dogs, then call them that now, that might uh, have um, struggle with, with uh, say, other dogs. There is a there is a, a kind of a, um, a desire to want to go straight in and think about okay, how do we shift this behaviour? How do we change that behaviour? Positive or punitive? But in my experience, this is anecdotal, I know, but uh, the vast majority of dogs I work with, it's a processing problem. In other words, that dog hasn't had chance to properly process and go into normal threat evaluation before that nervous system takes over. So if I'm going to work with that dog, then I need to learn something about how this dog generally, innately processes. What's this dog's processing um, criteria, if you like, or what's its learning style? So when I work with a dog-dog problem, uh, when that dog first comes along, it's very rare that I introduce a dog. Uh, 
and the owners get it right because I've already preloaded my what we're doing. I want to see how does this dog process me? How does this dog orientate in the environment? What does it need to do to feel safe? What connections does it need either from the carer or not from the carer? What connections does it need to make from the environment? Then I can think, right, if I'm going to reinforce anything with this dog, and of course we use positive reinforcement, right? Um, when we want to think about reinforcing something, I want to make sure I'm re reinforcing something that is innately useful to the dog. The, we think about jumping into counter conditioning stuff, but actually, I, I, you know, quite often, again, in my experience, it's about trying to set up the environment enough so the dog can go through a normal processing, uh, their normal processing um, structure. So we can try and keep as many of those doors open, stop that bucket from filling too much. When we think about Grisha Stewart and her bat, of course, this is uh, what, what I felt, just a little point on that. I, I don't know Grisha personally, so if you're listening in, Grisha, hi, hope you don't mind me talking about bat. Um, I think bat at its core is about giving the dog chance to try and process in an innate, natural way to then form some self-regulatory behaviours that we can then support. But the whole bat process was kind of jumped on with an operant lens. So that's why, uh, you know, because again, when we start getting on the opera merry-go-round, right, we can't agree with anything anymore because we're all thinking, well, this isn't that and this isn't this. But when we think about natural learning, so that's taking any reinforcements or punishing from the environment that comes along, if it's naturally internalized, then it actually becomes powerful. And if we're having a lot of opera input, are we, and I think we are, risking stopping some of that natural processing process that we're just artificially creating solutions where there, there hasn't been that, uh, that internalized natural learning that we kind of need to need to think about. And uh, when we think about our, us in the fourth free community, we have another label. Why do we believe this stuff, right? Why are we so passionate? It's got nothing to do with quadrants. I can tell you that. Uh, it's because we are empathetic, we are compassionate, we care about the uh, the rights of the animal to feel safe, we feel the animal uh, and their emotional experience, we recognise all that. And I think we're doing ourselves a disservice by keep fighting this dialogue within an operant model. Because we, the reason I call it the operant merry-go-round is because we will just keep going round and round and round. Big post put out a little while ago by uh, well-known trainers caused a big hoo-ha um, uh, and a lot of kind of confirmatory biases were coming out, a lot of cognitive dissonance going on. Um, I just think if we want to truly move forward, we have to allow ourselves to utilize the and step into and understand the dog's emotional experience and the need for relief. So instead of all these other terms we give for certain behaviors, I see them as relief seeking behaviors. They are something that they need to get relief from. Just to give you an example about relief, come back to that. Uh, there are two types of relief that I talk about, absolute and temporary. Actually, somebody pointed out to me, and it's very true, there is another, it's not a type of relief as such, but of course there is no relief, right? And that's very sad. Uh, and especially when we start thinking about learned helplessness and things like that, terms that we tend to use, I think we can start thinking about an animal or a human who has no relief, regardless of what they do. So I want you to imagine you've lost your mobile phone, right? Uh, if you, you'll then have that emotional experience that behind it, uh, and you will then be looking for relief seeking behaviors pretty quick because you want relief, right? If you find your mobile phone, that is absolute relief. So that individual stressor or trigger has now, uh, you've managed to kind of um, relieve that and the nervous system can back off because that's absolute relief. If you don't find your mobile phone, the most you can get is temporary relief. So that might be phoning the insurance company or whatever else. But you were, but the thing about temporary relief is it's not, it's not absolute, right? So um, uh, another good example of this uh, is a big temporary relief. If, you're, uh, if your husband's uh, a bit lazy and your kids are a bit feral and you don't like your job, um, sorry if I've described somebody's life there, but anyway. um, uh, and then you go and have that nice hot bubble bath with a glass of Prosecco, that's temporary relief, right? It's important, that's a behavior that's important to you, it gives you temporary relief. So temporary relief, very important. 
the problem, of course, is when you get out of the bath, your husband's still lazy, kids are still feral, and your job's still no good, right? So you just, but at least you've had some temporary relief. Um, uh, when we're working with dogs, the, if the first thing I'm going to do when I meet that dog is nothing, right? I just need to learn loads from this dog, and I need to think about what it is that this dog is trying to represent through their behavior regarding a relief seeking. And I want to go in and try and think, right, how can we at least give this dog some temporary relief? When we think about Sarah Fisher and her amazing free work principle, what I love about free work is because for some of these dogs who are, they're quite, um, they're quite challenging, some of them, right? In that moment, where they are able to explore and use their senses. They are opening doors, the bucket's draining. They're able to get temporary relief in that moment. And we learn so much about them from that moment. Um, the ideal uh, goal, of, of course, is absolute relief, especially when we think about physiological issues. Um, uh, if you have dental pain, if you take pain relief, that is temporary relief, right? When you go and see the dentist and they give you that root canal, absolute relief. So we just have to start thinking in these terms. I think the term relief kind of transcends conditioning anyway, really. Uh, it's our first goal. How do we provide relief for this animal? Then we can start dipping in our toolbox, which has to be a big one, right? So, uh, good, where was I now? Uh, just thinking about that. Okay, cool, so relief, important. So, stepping off the open no, Now, I was just saying about why we are passionate about this stuff because we're empathetic and passionate and everything else. Um, I think, uh, as I say, the more we can start talking in these terms, it gives people with a more traditional view of dogs, shall we say, less ammunition, right? It, it dilutes their arguments. Why keep arguing with people based in an operant model that actually is failing dogs anyway? Question mark. Um, because, uh, you know, even you know, when we start thinking about this stuff, it's pretty overwhelming, right? Uh, remember, this is a philosophical chat. But when I speak to Kim Brophy and she kind of deep dives into the eth ethological stuff or Kathy with the neurological stuff, I think, wow, almost kind of what we've been doing or thinking about dogs is kind of back to front, right? When you really step back and you think, God, OK. Uh, everything from how we breed through to early influences to how we look at puppies to how we train, how we deal with stuff, how caregivers are educated in the zeitgeist. We're having this lovely chat now, uh, many of us professionals, uh, many of us on our side of doing things. We forget that the norm, the zeitgeist, is still a dominance model that somehow dogs should bend to our will, that our, our expectation of behavior is paramount regardless of what that dog's emotional experience might be. There is so much that we need to do, and the only way we can do it is if we stop educating purely on a learning theory operant way, especially with caregivers. So with my clients, my carers, uh, and actually kind of the dog's my client, that's how I see it, they're the carer, right? Uh, I have to get them in on this straight away. Uh, and I have to get them in on it, and I have to think about the terminology I use uh, so that they can come on that process. And actually, do you know what? They are way less resistant than if I'd have gone in talking about behavior and talking about reinforcements, and I know behavior that's reinforced will be repeated. That just fits back into that notion of somehow that behavior is good, that behavior is bad, and all that kind of stuff. I need them to start recognizing, do you know what? Behavior is a communicative act. Behavior is an expression of our internal process, an internal process that is unique to each one of us, right? That snake analogy earlier, that snake, the snake itself isn't the problem, right? Because it's just wiggling along, doing its own thing. It is to that person because of their unique internal processing around what's happening around that snake. So we have to shift that dialogue on for me. We have to move away from looking at arbitrary uh, judgments of behavior and start looking at behavior as being more communicative. So this brings us to a couple of challenges then if we're thinking forwards for the industry for me. Um, two, two important things. First, we have to put more emphasis on neurology and physiology and included in that is a lot more emphasis on how we do really good observations 
So what I mean by that is observing without judgment or label. And that's hard, right? Because what I was talking about right at the beginning, we're kind of predisposed to being judgmental, right? So it's hard, right? We've got our own confirmatory biases, our own belief system. So we have to be, we have to train ourselves, using the training word, uh, we have to kind of teach ourselves to be, um, to try and do that. And of course, Sarah Fisher, Gemma Hodson, uh, great people to kind of reference if you want to start going on that kind of thing. Um, Andrea Breen, uh, great, uh, great Andrea Breen, um, I had an amazing conversation with her really uh, recently, blew, her, blew my mind, if you're listening Andrea, hello. Uh, she said about the watch, wait and wonder, and I love that. So when I go and see a dog for the first time, I'm just going to watch, right? I'm going I'm to wait, and then I'm going to wonder about things and try and pick up some pieces. I need to learn, not just if that dog, you know, if the dog's got an issue with dogs, I don't have to introduce the dog yet because I've got way more to learn from that dog. I need to do really good observations so I can learn about this dog and their unique way of processing and what their processing criteria is. For example, a lot of dogs I work with, they're big olfactory processors from a social engagement point of view. In other words, they want to olfactory process big time, uh, but they don't necessarily want to socially engage. But of course, they've got a history of just having the environment try and socially engage on you all the bloody time, right? So no wonder they're kicking off. You know, it's very easy to think when a dog's kicking off when you see the dog that the dog's fearful or the dog. But who knows? It could be the dog's like, oh god, I can't, I can't deal with it because they're going to try and come over and sniff my butt, or or that person's going to try and touch me, and I won't have a chance to do all my processing that I need to do. Uh, and some dogs are really into this kind of stuff, right? You know, doing free work again, you start to because we're slowing stuff down, and that's a big part of observation. Slow stuff down. To think, wow, isn't it interesting how that dog, when that happens in the environment, they shift that way a little bit, or that they go and do that little behavior there, what kind of thing. So that's how we can learn things. So yeah, teaching uh, ourselves about better observations. A lot of courses that we see for dog behavior and dog training, first thing is learning theory. Almost always, you're going to learn about learning theory first. So already we're, we're setting people up to have an overly judgmental view of uh, of behavior, right? Because we're already thinking about how do we change it? How do we change it? Uh, we're making presumptions about how they learn. Remember the difference between um, structured learning and their natural way of learning. Uh, and that's evidenced even in our school system. And here in the UK, we have a we have a comprehensive education system, which frankly fails many pupils, right? Because it's somebody somewhere has decided this is how you're supposed to act. This is how you're supposed to learn. I want you to think back, actually. This is a good point here. So I'm going off the tangents again. So hopefully you'll with me on this stuff. Um, uh, go back to your Scott time at school, right? And think about what you actually learned at school. Now, there might be a few topics that you can think, yeah, I really enjoyed uh, maths and I love maths. But there will be way more about that learning experience that is not about what you learn in a structured way. It is what you've learned through the experience, right? So I talk about Mr. Wilson a lot. Uh, I don't know whether he's still alive even, but um, I talk about him a lot. Uh, and he was my geography teacher. I don't remember anything about geography. I remember how he treated me though. I remember the learning experience. I remember about questioning authority through him. I, I learned a lot about fearing, get, making, getting things wrong through him. I learned a lot about uh, not feeling safe with my own sexual identity because he just used to throw the word puff around a lot to most of the guys. Um, uh, and uh, obviously, you know, so uh, so this is the thing, you know, we think we're teaching something. So if you've got a dog there that he's struggling, needs relief, and we're teaching them a solid sit stay, and we think, oh yeah, I'm a great trainer because I've got a solid sit stay. What have we actually, actually taught that dog? Now we think, yeah, I've taught you a sit stay. But have, I, have we also, or is the, the lesson the dog's taking from that, remember the natural learning rather than the structured learning, that actually no relief comes, that we aren't particularly emotionally relevant to them, uh, that they don't have freedom of movement in order to feel safe? I question mark on all this stuff, right? When you start working in this way, you start to see the consequences that can be accidentally, they're not deliberate, put in by a lot of operant training, right? And we're all an experience of that. When we think back to our school days, a lot of external pressure on how we were expected to behave and what we were expected to learn based on somebody else's notion of what results meant. So results, again, it falls back into the kind of opera mindset a little bit around, OK, this is what we need to see or this is what we're observing. Not always, I know, but in some areas. Who's setting those notion of results? When I think about uh, some of the, um, 
the kind of citizen schemes that we have where your dog goes along and, and you get a gold or a bronze or whatever. I'm not, remember we're having a philosophical chat, so I'm not saying these things are bad, but for me, I know that for some of those dogs who don't pass the mark, right? For some of those dogs, it was a huge achievement to be in that village hall in the first place. It was a huge achievement for them to be able to connect to the owner, to the carer in that environment in the first place. But because somebody externally said, actually, for this dog to be seen as a good citizen, right, they need to be able to do this, this and this in an arbitrary way, in a different environment, maybe at home, maybe in the garden, they might have done, right? But we, this is the risk of, of, of looking at things in, in, this, in this way. Um, right, there's something really important I wanted to say, uh, but I can't think of it because uh, what was I was going to say. Mm, 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 mm. Anyway, that. cool. So, um, so just a little summary. I started off by saying, if we think about behaviour in the terms of the behaviour we do, and the behaviour we judge in others, it's a great place to start. We have to analyze why we judge behavior and just check in with ourselves and think, right, am I projecting my narrative here? Am I projecting my expectations here? Uh, or am I actually looking at things? Um, uh, the, the behavior we do ourselves, so really think about why you do stuff. It's complicated, right? Think about the times when you sought relief through a behavior that has been shut down on you. I use my example of me as a, as a young gay man uh, in the 70s and 80s in the UK in a very hostile environment, mainly thanks to the government at the time. Uh, great TV show, It's a Sin, recently, looking back at that period and looking at the horrendous time these young men had just because they chose to love differently to what was seen as being the norm. Uh, but we find this a lot uh, ourselves that we kind of... Uh, you know, get shut down for trying to express ourselves through behaviours that somebody else might find inappropriate, but for us it's a chance to get relief, right? Uh, and then this thing about looking forward to the, for the industry, that, oh yeah, that's what I was saying, so there you go, I've come back around, I knew I would do. We need to think about doing more education and observations, I think it's very important, and also more education about how we communicate this stuff, right? I get so much feedback from uh, I, I had an email recently after the um, uh, a podcast I did with somebody, and I was talking about relief. And this uh, trainer, been trained for a long time, emailed me to say, God, you know what, I get the whole relief thing, and it really scares me now. Because I've been turning up with my operant toolkit saying, yeah, I'm going to do this, going to do that, going to do this, going to do that. Now I'm thinking, right, well, hang on a minute, what relief might be behind that behavior in the first place? And how do I bring my clients on board? Because... We all turn up right and we know that client is going to have a judgmental view to behavior. They're going to see that behavior as bad. They want us to do that fix. That's what they want. Huge amount of pressure on us because we're amazing trainers and we understand the power of operant training. We can provide them with something very quickly. Right. So to actually turn up and say, yeah, I'm not actually got any treats with me. Uh, actually, no, I'm not going to do anything with your dog. It takes a lot. Right. But there are ways to do it. And many people who work in this way. Uh, we've fine-tuned that way to be able to communicate early. It's what I call front-loading. I'm going to front-load with that carer about what we're doing. I need them to feel it, right? I need them to feel it. So I'm going to use human examples, and I'm going to be non-apologetic for that. There was a big anti-anthropomorphic movement about five years ago, uh, mainly because people were starting to treat dogs like little furry people, right? And I get that. But... The baby that's been thrown out of the bathwater is that somehow we're not supposed to allow the fact that the dogs might be having an emotional experience, that we might not think that they might feel something. And this notion that even now I hear, well, you know, how do you know how the dog feels? Well, I don't, right? But uh, Ruby, amazing Ruby, should have said at the beginning, thank you, Ruby, for arranging this. Uh, amazing. And it's been a really inspiring listen to people sharing their stories. Um, I think that's amazing. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, I'm, just, I'm just picking on you now, Ruby, because it's, uh, I just see your name come there, so I'm going to pick on you. Uh, I don't even know what Ruby feels, right? You know, when we step into the emotional experience, it's unique. So to say, oh, you don't know what a dog feels, well, I don't know what you feel listening now. I don't know how you individually process stuff. But I do know, neurologically, physiologically, hormonally, we all share the mechanics of that experience. It's the uniqueness that gives us our own emotional experience, right? 
So um, we need to be brave to say to clients, right, I need you to step into your dog's emotional experience by looking at your own. Because what a dog thinks about, who knows? You know, one of my dogs is a Labrador, so it's probably food. But I know as a fellow mammal what it feels like to be nervous, frustrated, trapped, excited. I like to use those two analogies. You can have them. Well, the bucket one wasn't mine in the first place. The doors one is one I came up with. But when my clients say, even after one session, they're saying, oh, yeah, we're closing doors here. My dog hasn't got enough doors open, so they can't process anything. So there's no point in me barking, uh, you know, commands at my dog because they're not actually going to process it, right? Uh, oh, yeah, the dog, the bucket's too full. It's a good one for us, the bucket, actually. If you if you fall out with your loved one, you can just say, oh, I'm sorry, my bucket was a bit full. Um, but you know, we can always say, and this is, um, uh, this is important. And I think, uh, so teaching better, how do we do good observations? Learning about neurology and physiology in a simple way. You don't have to become a neurologist or a physiologist. You just have to recognize that actually pre-behavior is a lot of stuff, right? From sensory integration, even that alone, you know, we all have biases with our senses about what we have as our primary sensory input. Dogs, of course, olfactorily. What do we do the moment that dog comes into our lives? We do training, which is, involves look at this or hear that. Um, puppy classes. The first thing we're doing is teaching them physical stuff to do without having first learned how do they process stuff. You know, the, the amazing Jane Arden, I don't know if Jane's here, uh, but Jane, uh, I hear, I've heard Jane talk before now, and I love how Jane's approach to training because she obviously uses an off-print means, of course, but she starts from the point of view of thinking, right, what puppy do I have in front of me? What dog do I have in front of me? And that is more important than the owner turning up uh, saying, right, I want my dog to learn this, this, and this today. We have to think, right, what can your dog actually do today? And what is, you know, and I think this is just how we need to rethink things. So uh, my time's up. So uh, I'm hoping that this little philosophical chat has just opened a few doors for you uh, on a few things. There's so much to explore and the beyond the operant, uh, and it's beyond the operant, it's not instead of the operant, right? it's just beyond it. Uh, they're good places to hear these kind of dialogues. Um, I'm setting up a new online resource, which is coming very soon, called uh, Dog Centered Care with Andrew Hale. Sounds very interesting. Uh, Dog Centered Care, and there's gonna be a lot of stuff there about looking at this, because this is what I frame it as, Dog Centered Care in the same way we have child-centered care, right? We have to put the dog in the center of it. We have to recognize our amazing skills as trainers, but we have to kind of park that at the door. And operant solutions, in my opinion, it's just my opinion, and you can disagree with it, that's fine, should be a tool in the toolkit. It shouldn't be the toolkit. And in fact, conditioning generally, uh, when we think about these kind of things, it should be just part of the toolkit that starts with thinking about, right, how can we best get this dog to process and engage with their nervous system so they can self-regulate? In human psychology, I meant to say this at the beginning, actually, I've got a human psychology background, should have thrown that in, uh, and I'm also a behaviourist, should have thrown that as well, because some of you don't know why. Uh, just some random bloke sharing his thoughts, never mind. Um, so human psychology, we have two terms that we use a lot. Uh, self-regulated and dysregulated, right? So self-regulated means regardless of what that nervous system is doing, we have an opportunity to be able to have some kind of conscious say, if you like, of what's going to happen next. We have the ability to be able to make those better choices. Dysregulating nervous systems just took over, right? We're just in that mercy. Uh, and um, that's how I see it a lot with these doggies. And um, they're just dysregulating, really. We, we say, all oh, the dog's aggressive. You know, what does aggression mean, even? Uh, you know, I don't like that term aggressive because it doesn't tell me anything, right? Uh, somebody's decided it's, an, it's that, but uh, I, I, we've got to start saying, actually, no, I, I see a stressed dog, right? I see a stressed dog who's trying to get relief. Um, so, okay, I think I've offered enough there because it's now two o'clock. Uh, look out for Dog Centre Care. Uh, it's going to be out soon um, and there's going to be great resources there. Um, uh, um, uh, I'm going to put some links in the comments later. Uh, I'll have a look at the comments in a bit. Um, and hopefully, uh, oh yeah, and I also put in my, my Phantom of the Opera uh, blog that I wrote a little while ago. Uh, you can have a look at that. And hopefully you've enjoyed listening. Uh, it's been great chatting. Uh, and uh, I hope um, uh, uh, we can...
to each other again sometime and we can all have a chat let's just talk let's think about how we can move forwards not just move on right thanks very much everybody great to see you um go and have your sunday lunch now or get to church or whatever it is you do on a sunday uh and uh, yeah thanks very much for coming bye <laughs>